He is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. I forgot my fill in the blank. Lunch money, passport, driver's license, identification card of some kind, ticket that you purchased weeks ago to get into wherever, and now you can't get in. Not having that lunch money means I might not get my lunch. I might not get on that plane. I might, if you have any military background, not be able to get onto that base. Having lost that key to entry, how will you get in? I have knowledge of a young man who was in a rental car in Germany and he left his passport in the glove box of the rental car. And when they got to the process to get on the plane, he discovered, he put it in there so, so that he wouldn't lose it because he knew he had the tendency to lose things in his pockets. But when they got to the check to get into the airport, he was without a passport. Now his aunt frantically called the, the rent-a-car place and said, we know that the passport's in there. He left in the glove box, he told us, oh no, there's no passport anywhere. Don't worry, a few days later he got on a plane and came home to be with his family in America. I happen to know the young man. I raised him. <laughs> his, uh, his aunt was of course very unhappy when the rental car place called her a few months later and said, oh, we have a passport we found in a glove box. I also know of a young man, because he's me, who when he was, oh, I don't know, first, second grade, he was in the front seat. He got to sit in the front seat for, you know, that, he was the oldest child. And his mother handed him her ID card to get onto the base. He was sitting in the front of a VW bus, one of those first ones that had the big shiny thing on the front. And uh, he, he knew that that would meant he'd get to show the card to the guy going to the gate so they'd get in. Well, being the, the smart guy that I am, I said, look, there's this nifty little holder for cards right up on the dashboard. I'll just set it up there, and then the guy can see it, and we can wave at him. Yeah, well, of course, you know that's a vent. And right there inside, we didn't get on the base. We turn around and go back. As our neighbor tried to fish my mother's ID card out of the vent of the van, these are difficult experiences all of us probably have from personal experience, embarrassing, inconvenient, sometimes even scary. I'm sure that you can identify with these experiences, unless of course in the room is the perfect person who's never lost anything important. Oh, yeah, I doubt that. So this key to entry is pretty important. What do you believe? That Jesus is the key to the entry into paradise? A simple number one Sunday school answer to the question, of course. Maybe you grew up in the faith and later took ownership of that gift as you grew and learned in the faith. Maybe later in life you learned of the gift of Jesus Christ, this key, and was baptized into it. Maybe you have some other experience that brought you to saving faith. I was blessed with the gift of faith at the age of 12 days old. And later, when I was in around ninth grade, I was confirmed into that faith in a little church in Homa, Louisiana. I Transitioned, however, as I grew older, that childlike faith wasn't serving me very well. It is important for your faith to be childlike, don't get me wrong, but as you grow, your faith needs to grow as well. I knew and understood the gospel clearly. There was no question. But as I was raised in our nation's education system, I was also a pretty devout evolutionist. I believed that we had descended from microbes. 
those two didn't go together very well and they even went together less well when I started spending my Friday mornings, most Friday mornings in the, in the mid, mid to late 80s, I would drive up to the end of Point Loma, this is San Diego, and there was this World War II pillbox with lots of transmitters on it. And I had to go out there in the morning and turn a switch on. Then I had to sit there and do nothing for two hours and wait to turn the switch off. So I had two hours. And while I did read some other important professional documents, I can assure you, I also had a lot of time to read. And actually during those mornings over a couple year period, got to sit down and reflect and read the Bible cover to cover for the first time in my adult life and went through a lot of interesting spiritual growth. And one of those things that happened to me was I found my beliefs in conflict. My scientific beliefs seemed to be in conflict with my faith beliefs. That started me on a very long and interesting trip down the debate between creation and evolution now some 30 years later. For every person in this room, you have a living faith. And it's also some point of growth in the spectrum for you. You are either well fed and you have your ID card in hand and you know where you're going and you know where you need to be and when you need to be there. Or maybe you have your pass in hand, but you're really not sure where you're going. Or maybe you are spiritually starving. You've lost your passport, and you're not even sure where you're going. When they went to the tomb on that first Easter Sunday, they were expecting to find a corpse in order to treat it with spices. But they had not even considered the stone. How would they get past that large stone? Sealed and guarded stone. Who was going to move that stone for them? Oh, look, it's open. There's no question about how it got open. Oh, look, it's open. Next thing, we move right on in the narrative. I may have forgotten my past, but I don't need it. The door's open. At this point, I'd like to point out that, that you believe because he rose from the dead. Without this, Paul tells us pretty clearly, our faith is meaningless. The question is, will you trust in him? And go tell it on the mountain, to borrow a phrase from a popular hymn and scripture. Even those who do not believe have to deal with some difficult Easter facts. Instead of them asking us why we believe what we believe, the real question is, why don't you believe when there's such a mountain of evidence? There is really no historical question within the realm of those who study history, no historical question as to whether or not a real man named Jesus existed some 2,000 years ago. There is no real historical question as to whether or not a real man named Jesus was crucified some 1,982 years ago. Yes, the mountain of evidence is so big, we've got it down to within a year or two. If on April the 3rd, 33 AD, if you do the math on that, now, there was no Gregorian calendar 2,000 years ago, but the first Easter would have been on April the 5th, just like this one. A very interesting side note that has no significance to what I'm talking about. There is no, I just, I enjoyed researching it and finding it, and I want to share it with you. That's all there is to it. <laughs> there is no real historical question as to whether or not a real man named Jesus his followers were stunned and saddened at the fact that he had been crucified. 
There is no real historical question as to whether or not this real man named Jesus Christ was buried in a tomb. And that tomb was found to be empty on Easter Sunday morning. There is no real historical question as to whether or not this real man named Jesus, his followers, cheered up amazingly only days after his death and went around proclaiming his resurrection. An interesting point. If you're going to make something up and spread a lie, it's beneficial to you if that lie is beneficial and you benefit from it. But we happen to know that all of the apostles, with the exception of a couple of them, gave their lives for this truth. If you're going to go around sharing something and you made it up and it's a lie, which is what some will argue, why would you give your life for a lie? God starts this powerful, long list of trusted witnesses to Christ with women. This flies in the face of worldly thought of the day. If you're going to make up a story about someone raising from the dead, you wouldn't want to make your first witnesses women. Back then, they didn't see them to be reliable witnesses. This screams authenticity of the text. There couldn't have been collusion, which some will argue. They gave their life for this truth. If you're going to give your life for something, it's going to be true. I mean, I don't think, I don't know of anyone who would give their life for a lie. You must believe it to be true, to be willing to give your life for it. There is no real historical question as to whether or not he lived, died, and that his tomb was empty. Many who persecuted him later saw that he was who he claimed to be, that he was a fulfillment of all of this Old Testament truth that proclaimed that he was coming. Most of the first converts to Christianity were Jews. Every Sunday, every Sunday, is a witness to his resurrection. Worldwide, a third of the world's population celebrates this historical truth. No one questions the historical reality of things like Pontius Pilate, Tiberius, ancient historians like Josephus and Tacitus. They confirmed his existence. Thousands upon thousands of martyrs gave not just the initial witnesses, the eyewitnesses gave their lives for this truth. Throughout history, people have given their lives for this truth. For the first three centuries, we know that Christianity went in and out of persecution. So people were giving their lives as witnesses. And last century, the 1900s, the combined total of those who were martyred in the 1900s <coughs> is more than the martyrs of all of the previous 1800 years, 18 centuries combined. We don't even realize how many people are giving their lives for their faith on a regular basis. Such a cloud of witnesses. So the real question is not why should I believe in Jesus Christ? The real question is why would you not believe in this clear historical truth? The historic, archaeological, and manuscript evidence is so great that some scholars <coughs> say this overwhelming amount of evidence is so much that it's almost embarrassing. When compared with any other event in history, in ancient history especially, so much so that if you are aware of this evidence, it takes more faith not to believe than it does to believe. But our sinful nature does not like to be submissive, and faith is an issue of submission. We have to see it, to believe it, so to speak. We need to touch like Thomas. We need proof. Never mind 
that there is, if you don't believe in that, then there's another belief. It's called secular humanism with its holy trinity, science, self, and society. It has no basis in fact. Its theories are billions of years old, and last I checked, you can't observe millions or billions of years in a scientific lab. So it must be believed in. And those who believe it, believe it with greater fervor than many who claim to believe in Christ. We want God to show us, and he does. We forget that he gave us that pass of faith to believe the truths, and he proves it to us as well. But we claim to know better than God, and we're not sure if we accept these truths. Ten plagues, which knocked down the gods of the Egyptians, not enough. A pillar of cloud and fire that wander around with two to three million people in the desert for 40 years, not enough. Parting of the Red Sea, not enough. Healing of the sick, not enough. Raising others from the dead, not enough. Raising himself from the dead, not enough. Not enough for those who are dead in their sin. The cross is foolishness to those who do not believe. Those are the people that God has called us to share the gospel with. We have our own struggles, of course, making it difficult to be who God calls us to be. They will plague us, these struggles that we have, until we stop breathing. But he calls us to trust in him and share these truths anyway. And to take comfort in our baptism, which connects us to his death and his resurrection. To take comfort in the Lord's Supper, which nourishes that faith that he planted in us with his real presence, his flesh and blood. We take comfort in those things. And on this day, we take comfort in his resurrection, which we celebrate this morning as every Sunday morning. Because it really happened. <coughs> it's a pass, a pass that he gives us, a ticket to entry that we cannot lose. And no one can take it from us. Now we can throw it away, but we can't lose it, and no one can take it away from us. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, <coughs> dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him? Go and tell the disciples and Peter. Now it's your turn. Go and get fed in his church on a regular basis. And by the way, Scripture defines a regular basis as weekly. <laughs> Word and sacrament will feed and sustain your faith. He gave it to you. He shed his blood for you. Go, tell the world what he has done for you and for them. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. We continue.